swashbuckling are gone, there are still many people, especially in Europe, for whom the fine points of sword play are far from a dying art. Fencing has become a sport of style and skill. This is in a pay. Other fencers use sabers or the more flexible foil. But where we're about to go, Milan, Italy, the ape is the fencing weapon of choice. Be on your toes for the next 15 minutes. We're on guard in Milan. Fencing, a sport born of brutal combat and vanished codes of honor. Where knights and noblemen once dueled to the death, men now execute a precision battle of wit and agility. A duel of minds as well as swords. A fluid game of human chess. A major center for modern fencing is the Italian city of Milan. In the midst of this fashion-conscious, up-to-the-minute urban center, the ancient sport of swordplay still flourishes. Milan's fencing schools have contributed much to the Italian tradition of top-ranked fencing. One of the most prestigious of these schools is the 103-year-old fencing club of the Società del Giardino. Within its elegant and spacious halls, the sport is taught by Arturo Volpini. He has been training champions at the Giardino for 26 years. To become a good fencer, one needs reflexes, a sense of self-control, and remarkable discipline. Then, one must also have passion, tenacity, and cleverness. But fundamentally, what forms the student is always the master. This master is to his students as a balanchine is to young dancers. He rules with complete authority, a figure to be respected, obeyed, and revered. What Volpini strives to instill in his young students first is an acute sense of distance and timing an unfailing ability to judge how, when, and where to strike with lightning-fast judgment. Endless drilling is required before the fencer can move intuitively with speed and agility, finally leaving the mind free to create winning strategies and outwit his opponent. Dozens of champions have emerged from the halls of the Giardino. The whole wall is dedicated to the Olympic winners alone. Of these, one stands out as the most successful fencer of all time. Eduardo Mangiorati has the distinction of having won more medals than any athlete in history, including 19 gold, 13 silver, and 7 bronze in Olympic and world competitions. I toured all over the world, and wherever I went, they gave me gold medals. In Argentina, Brazil, France, Germany, England, Venezuela. No matter where I went, they gave me gold medals, and I put them all here. Eduardo continues a legacy bequeathed by his father a renowned fencing master at the Giardino in the early 20th century. In 1967, Eduardo and his brother Dario opened the Mangiarati Fencing School, now one of the most prominent in Milan. The elegance that made Eduardo a champion can still be seen as he fences with his daughter Carola. <laughs> Eduardo no longer competes. 
It is said that two lifetimes are required to master the sport. For by the time one is old enough to grasp the subtleties of the game, the body is too old to execute them. At 31, Stefano Belloni is one of the top-ranked fencers in the world. But he must train constantly to stay on top. In the modern surroundings of the Mangiarotti, lessons include watching videotapes to train for an art of combat that goes back at least 3,000 years. Early swordplay involved almost as much wrestling as use of weapons. Finesse was not a major requirement. In the Middle Ages, massive swords with heavy blades were needed to slash through armor plates. With the development of firearms during the Renaissance, sword fighting became less important in warfare. The sword became lighter and thinner and was used more often in dueling. It was then that the fencing master rose to prominence, wielding great power along with his sword, for he trained men in an art that could mean the difference between life and death. In France alone, 30,000 men were killed in duels in one 80-year span. So a good fencing master was a worthwhile investment. Gentlemen always used to carry a sword. And naturally, if they bumped into another gentleman on the street, they would inevitably get into a dispute about which one of them should yield to the other. Then they would challenge each other, and of course, one of the two usually ended up getting killed. Of the three types of modern competitive sword play, the rules of Epee are closest to those of an actual duel. In the 1984 Olympics, Stefano Belloni fences with an Epee against a Swiss opponent. The challenge of fencing no longer rests with who can strike the heaviest blow, but instead in the art of surprise, evasion, deception, and speed. What began as a bloody battle fought in heavy armor is now a ballet in white, judged by men in tuxedos and scored by points rather than by who survives. Touch left against Mr. Parfait, Mr. Bellone wins, 10 to 4. La victoire à Monsieur Bellone. Fencing remains a combat sport, person against person. It's a very fast sport, and when you are caught up in the heat of the moment, you feel as if you are really fighting for your life. Competitive fencing requires discipline. Training may stretch up to seven hours a day, every day. The Italian national team is undergoing a rigorous five-day workout at the Giardino, preparing for a World Cup event to be held in Poitiers, France. The exercises focus on skills such as lunging, which is the main offensive action in fencing, and the flesh, a running attack made at high speed. The essence of fencing lies in subtlety. Sentiment de fer is the ability to anticipate an opponent's next move by the mere touch of the blades. Droite is the use of only two fingers, the thumb and forefinger, to actually control the movement of the blade. During the practice bouts, electric wires are attached to the weapon so that each touch is registered. A similar method of scoring will be used in actual competition. Valpini can offer a few final notes to the team before they leave for Poitiers. But once the competition begins, each man will be on his own. 
Poitiers, France. This ancient town has seen its share of sword play in earlier times. 97 fencers from all over the world will meet here. The competition will be extremely tough. The Italian team has been highly ranked for decades, but other countries have edged up, particularly some of the Eastern Bloc nations. Monsieur Bellon is demandé piste numéro 6. Stefano may face up to 30 opponents in these preliminary rounds. Judges carefully check the tip of the epée by weighting it to make sure only legitimate hits will be registered. Bouts are quick, lasting only a matter of minutes. Most of the time is spent in trying to deceive the opponent by quick feints and dodges. Attacks are few and far between. At the end of the elimination rounds, Stefano stands as one of the eight individuals who will go on to the main event. The finals are held the following day in a medieval building befitting the antiquity of the sport. When the pairings are announced for the matches, Stefano faces a dilemma. He must fight one of his own teammates. It is Angelo Mazzoni, ranked number two in the world, eight places above Stefano. If Stefano loses, he will strengthen his team's chances for capturing the World Cup. But he is a trained competitor, trained to win. The most important thing for a fencer is to be very cold-blooded. Once you put on the mask, you should be ready to fight. Fight till the end against your opponent. And never give up. Angelo Mazzoni emerges the winner in the bout between the two Italians. But ultimately, it is a German and a Hungarian who face each other in the final contest. Very quickly, the Hungarian is victorious. The Italian team will return to Milan and their masters, seeking the elusive touch that will make them the victors in the future. In order to become a good swordsman, we are born with some qualities that Mother Nature endows us with. But the main thing, I think, is to have a lot of willpower, a certain spirit of sacrifice, and especially a good master, because it's the master who forms the student. Those words ring true as Eduardo Mangiarotti begins to pass on to his young grandson the first steps in a long and noble tradition.